So all right, time to get started. Uh, I'm Tom, I'm the community engineer for Cloud Zero, and I'm going to be talking about iterative security, secrets management when you're not yet ready for Vault. Um, two things I really want to get across in this presentation today, and they're actually not about secrets management. They're how do I decompose security problems and solve them systematically, and how do I solve, um, how do I solve system problems given the constraints of time, complexity, and risk. The sort, you know, not letting perfect be the enemy of the good. So I created this presentation originally based on a blog post I had written, and what I found when discussing online was people are actually very happy about seeing a simpler alternative than you know the much harder systems like Vault or say Conjure and, and um, like Conjure. Both very good, but they weren't at that level of sophistication yet. They weren't ready for that, and they were happy to be able to just, you know, move a little bit forward. And so what I ended up realizing was, you know, the value of, you know, this, you know, that blog post and this presentation wasn't actually secrets management. It was again the, my approach to take, you know, to solving this sort of problem that so many of us face. So uh, who is this guy up here? You've already heard the dramatic reading of me. Uh, again, I'm Tom McLaughlin, community engineer at Cloud Zero. That's one of my cats, Nutmeg. As at, we were at the speaker dinner yesterday, I got a text from my girlfriend letting me know that for some reason the cat just saw the uh, oven open and wanted to go exploring and nearly jumped in it. That is also the one of our two that we consider to be the smarter cat. <laughs> um, so Cloud Zero, we're an early stage startup focusing on cloud reliability optimization. And so our work centers around creating, um, creating systems that fail less, and then ultimately recovering faster when they do fail. We are also using uh, AWS serverless architecture to, to build our product. So if you're interested in either of those two topics, come talk to me afterwards. Um, I'm a former full-time ops engineer. I spent most of my time working on automation. I have a lot of pointed views about Puppet and how to do like, you know, automation correctly. Uh, today, community engineer, my job is to engage with the audience and ultimately learn more from all you folks. Uh, I've started adding this sort of, uh, this, this few slides into my presentations, because I feel that if you, you know, if you understand how I view problems and what's important to me, you can understand why I've come to the particular conclusions that I've made. I don't believe most technical arguments are actively, or actually, ob uh, objective or even technical at all. They're really disagreements over the problem to be solved and you know, the sort of subjective weighing of pros and cons to the different solutions proposed. So, yep, there we go. Uh, I like startups. I, I think they're frustrating and a total clown show, but I also think they're really freaking fun. They operate very differently than your average you know, organization, and I found that they actually, you know, it works pretty well for me. Uh, it also means that my problems tend to be a lot smaller in scale than most people. I don't have Google, Facebook, or Netflix sized problems. I don't want to be solving those problems. Uh, I'm usually dealing with the first iteration of a solution towards solving a problem at, you know, at my company. Uh, so what I also do, my engineering is typically geared more towards company survival than absolute correctness. Uh, I don't have time to always be perfect. And we're gonna go come back later on down the road and kind of fill in the gaps of everything that we're, we're doing now. Uh, again, I just wanna make continuous forward progress in anything that I'm working on. Uh, engineering is just a title to me. I, you know, I really, I just show up, I show up to solve problems and contribute some sort of value. It just happens that the majority of the uh, way I solve problems is through engineering. If I need to use different skills, if I need to think a little bit more creatively, I'm going to use that. I love this uh, this cartoon up there because you know if Thanos can't use Majolner to to hit Thor, he's just going to use Thor to hit Majolner repeatedly. All right, so okay, let's get started here. I have lots of I have lots of work to do. Who, who here has lots of work to do? Okay, some of you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I have lots of work to do, and I have limited time or resources to be able to do everything. Uh, what do I need to be doing? I need to be keeping the site up. I need to make sure it's performing. I need to make sure that uh, developers are, de are delivering features. Security is just one of those things in the, you know, the many parts of my, of my wheelhouse. And secrets management, these are complicated systems to underst understand. And for any of us, this actually ends up as, as reality. If you take a close look in there, you will see a uh, database username and password that was living in code. Um, and it's something that I've, you know, you can laugh, but person, you know, your friend right next to you may well be doing, you know, be dealing with this right now. I see a few heads nodding. I have totally been there. I have totally been in situations where I've been looking at code and realizing, oh wow, all these, uh, we have passwords here, we have API tokens all here. They're literally just sitting in Git, in Git, in our code. And so we have all this technology, but why does this problem like, you know, still exist for us? Why do we still have people you know, taking passwords and tokens, et cetera, and putting them in code when we know we're just not supposed to be doing that? And for much, you know, I think much of the reason is <laughs> this is how we present security today, you know? There's no in between. You're secure, you're not secure, and there's a ton of like assumed knowledge between points A and B, okay? And all this, you know, leads to security paralysis. We know, we we don't have a clue what to do. We don't have a clue how to get from point A to B. And given eight other choices of priority, we're going to kind of, sh you know, shift our focus towards the things we can actually be you know, actually accomplish. We're rewarded at work for actually accomplishing things, okay? We're not rewarded for trying, struggling, and totally failing. And so long as a disaster doesn't strike, no one's kind of the wiser, okay? So we can just sometimes just, you know, pretend that, you know, it, everything's fine, it's all good. Um, some of the things that, you know, you all are, you know, you're all are responsible for as ops folks, access controls. How much is too much access? Password policies. How often should I rotate passwords? Oh, yeah, great. NIST actually decided to change that. Uh, they have a new recommendation. Don't force rotation. Awesome. Patching. How often, you know, how often should I patch? How fast should I patch? Should I just patch you know, every single night? Just ship, you know, ship it to production? Or should, should I have some sort of patching and testing cadence? And with all those questions in mind, this is basically what you're left with. Good luck, we're all counting on you. Keep everything secure, and we're gonna blame you if something fails, okay? <laughs> We've put this in your hands, now it's up to you to figure it out, awesome. Um, so one thing you know, I wanna be up here and, and be clear is I don't speak as a security expert. I'm an ops person who has been tasked with having to you know, secure my environment in some way o over time, and I had to learn how to better secure the environments I worked with, um, that, that I've worked in. So what we're gonna discuss is what I call iterative security. Its uh, approach kind of falls in line very well with uh, the approach I take toward, towards startup engineering. Uh, just, we're just going to start gradually getting, you know, improving our environment over time. We're going to start with lower hanging fruit. We're going to start with a simpler solution, and as we develop in maturity, we can work towards, you know, towards uh, more sophisticated goals. So, why is security again hard, so hard for us? Thinking back to that owl. Well, one thing is we get a lot. Of, we get very distracted by shiny objects in the security world. Okay, um, what are some of them? Zero days, okay? Nobody expects them. You show up one day, you roll into work, you're all set to do something, and next thing you know, some zero day comes out, and great, there goes my day, okay? This is what I have to focus on. Um, hash collisions and other assorted cryptographic weaknesses. Shattered, where you know two different files that produce identical SHA ones. I saw people wondering if you know the Git, um, the Linux Git repo was going to be poisoned, you know, via this method. Uh, the government, the government can hack things. The government can do all sorts of stuff. They, you know, they stockpile exploits. They treat cyber as its own battlefield. Logos, okay, these are all the cool things that. <laughs> We roll in, you know, we're, we're sitting there, we're on Twitter, we're on Slack, we're on IRC, and these are the sort of things that people are, you know, people are discussing. Awesome, cool. 
And here are the things we don't really get excited about. Patching. <laughs> this, is, this is my obligatory Equifax slide because it's simply topical right now. Uh, I am not looking to name and shame any companies or employees. I, what I really just want to point out is how such a mundane thing can lead to such a, you know, a massive failure. And I don't like calling patching simple. It's not, okay? Um, not every system can be patched, and not every organization actually makes patching you know, that easy. Uh, not leaving MongoDB exposed to the internet with weak credentials. Uh, there was a ransomware attack earlier in this year. Uh, automated worm, that was, yep, I see you hold, putting your head down. <laughs> uh, pub <laughs> publicly exposed MongoDB systems with re weak credentials just sitting there out in the internet and a worm traveling and <laughs> no credentials, thank you, no credentials on the internet and a worm that was, it was um, going around and, you know, again, taking them over and Bitcoin ransoming, ransoming them. And then from there we went to not leaving Elasticsearch uh, exposed on the internet with weak credentials. A few weeks later, the same damn thing happening again. They just changed, you know, they just changed their target. And then finally, actually learning from our mistakes, after Elasticsearch, uh, MySQL started being targeted, and I just decided to proactively warn the Postgres community that they were going to be next. <laughs> like, no one's paying attention. Uh, and, you know, this was early this year. All these systems was over the span of, like, three months. You know, every time people finally got around to, you know, fixing one problem, they just said, okay, we'll just target the next problem. So for many of us, we focus on, on the wrong things. We get too caught up about whether or not you know, we can protect ourselves from the NSA. And we look at that little like, you know, red like, exclamation point in the top saying we have updates. And we go, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get that eventually. Um, be clear, some of you do have legitimate reasons to worry about zero days and logo of the month. But many of us are not exactly um, taking care of the basics, and we should really be taking you know, less time worrying about advanced persistent threats and more time actually securing our databases, our, S or our open S3 buckets, and so forth. So back to the owl. OK, draw the damn owl. Um, we don't do a very good job, again, of explaining how you get from point A to point B. OK, we leave it up to you. And what we should be doing is actually teaching how to systematically assess risk and improve incrementally. Where do you start? How do you progress? Okay. What should your security posture ultimately look at, at the, you know, in the end? Are you just an owl head? Are you some side turn thing, face forward? You know, what, is your, what should your posture be? And you can find something that, you can usually find information that works on my machine. And then you can find information about, you know, developed by companies with ops teams many times larger who decided to like half re-implement Kerberos and open source it, okay? There's, there's not a lot of in-between information, okay? Most of us are in the middle and particularly towards the left, like I've just gotten off my machine, there isn't a lot of information out there. You know, we focus on these much, you know, these much more sophisticated solutions. But again, many of us are not yet at, you know, are capable of that sophistication. So we know not to put passwords, API keys, tokens, et cetera, into code. And it still happens, okay? So we're gonna solve this, you know, we're gonna solve this problem like it's an actual problem at work. And what we're going to do is we're going to develop a threat model for, you know, for a, for a hypothetical system. Uh, if you're paying attention to like nothing else in this presentation, pay attention to the next few slides. Like this is the meat, this is the stuff that you will actually learn something and you can apply after you leave this. Um, so again, we're going to start by identifying and assessing, you know, some sort of security threats within our environment. First, we're going to be realistic when we create our threat model, okay? Uh, who, you know, who you are affects who, you know, affects the, affects the uh, threats, the threats that you face and who is after you. If you're a large financial institution, you are probably worrying, you know, worrying about very sophisticated attackers, nation states, all that sort of stuff. 
If you're a dating app, you should probably be less worried about China and Russia and more about employees, whether they're current or ex, uh, automated attacks, or even like, what is your API exposing about, it, about its users to other people? Um, be realistic about damage potential. If every single issue means your company is going to go out of business, you're not gonna get anything done. Everything is a priority one done. Um, maybe you prioritize um, risk with financial penalties over things that are just kind of embarrassing, okay? So ask yourself, how well can you defend yourself against the person dropping USB sticks in your parking lot versus the man in the ceiling? And assess and rank damage appropriately. Um, companies survive being breached, okay? This is a fact of life. Uh, it's not a license to do nothing, but it means you, know, you, sh you can work at continuously improving. You don't have to start at you know, completely secure. Uh, and originally I was gonna put logos of different companies that have been breached. Uh, I'm really against you know, naming and shaming, so I took all those off, and so I'll leave it as a thought exercise to you. Name a bunch of companies where you've heard, you know, where you understand that they had a data breach, and then ask yourself, do you still shop there? Do you still use their services? So I'll leave it all up to you. So um, we're going to start by identifying what we actually have to protect in our organization. That is our first step. We have intellectual property. We have customer data, you know, the sort of data that, you know, about our customers that we, um, that we have. We have, in some cases, customers' data. We have data from our customers that we collect that is, you know, that is valuable to an attacker, if, even if they just want to actually attack that customer. Um, try and figure out next what you have to work with. Uh, do you actually know what your environment looks like? Okay, good, it is playing. Um, do you have a way of actually finding everything in your environment? Do you? Uh, all it takes is that one lone system you've kind of forgotten about until, like, you know, forgotten into institutional memory, that that's gonna cause a really bad day for you. Um, also, I really like this graphic because if you watch a lot of the balls move around, you'll see all these complicated maneuvers they go through, and at the end, the ball just like explodes or disintegrates, and you're just like, it went through all that work to literally produce like no value at all, okay? It's like, it's a, it's a metaphor for some organizations. <laughs> um, all right, so once you have an idea of what you're actually working with, it's time to start decompose, you know, decomposing your system. Map out uh, system boundaries and data flows. And what I have here is, is a nice hypothetical system. I don't want to fall off here. Um, we have customers, they have agents, and they are sending data. It's going through an, uh, an ELB. We have our ingestion service. The ingestion service, in turn, takes these events, drops them off to RabbitMQ. Consumers pick them up, and they write, you know, they write to, uh, to RDS. Come all the way over to here. You have your users. Again, they're going through an ELB to our front end host. They want to know about the data that we've actually been collecting from them. Uh, and so again, they query a back end service. Again, querying RDS where we've just been writing to. Um, next, we're going to take a look at the perimeters of this system. So what we have is, um, you know, we, we, have, we have our agents that are sitting, you know, sitting at customers. They are connecting you know, to, you know, to our system. We generate an, an API key when these hosts are registered. So that's their, that's their form of authentication. This link right here, we're using, we're using encryption. Um, there is no direct access to our, to our ingestion host. We protected that via, uh, via our network configuration with VPCs and security groups. Um, Going over again to this side, similar situation. We have users. They log in with a username and password. We're encrypted. You know, we're, again, it's an, uh, it's an encrypted connection. 
We go through load balancer. Again, no direct access to our front to our front end app. And hey, we're even actually doing some sort of like user input sanit like san sanitization to prevent things like SQL injection attacks. We're making sure that when these when this person is trying to actually access their data, they're not doing it in nice, you know, little bobby drop tables or something like that. So now we come to another point. Yeah. Um, we ingest data from clients, we send it to RabbitMQ, and then a consumer picks it up and sends and puts into RDS. RabbitMQ requires some form of authentication. How are we managing passwords? Not a clue. Okay. Um, maybe again, maybe they're living in code. All right. Here's a pr here's a problem in our system that we have actually identified. Uh, getting access to RabbitMQ that lets an attacker take a look at our customer data in real time. Moving over to, uh, further in the pipeline, we have RDS again, where we, you know, we, we, write, um, we write our event data to, and when we have the backend service that wants to, that wants to um, fetch this event data, RDS, passwords, we're not sure how we're managing them. Uh, and here, this is actually really even more valuable. This is like the crown jewels. This is our customer's data over time. You get access to this. You, know, you can look through what our customers are actu you know, have actually been doing. So we've identified, we've identified a few threats, some of which we, you know, we, we feel are addressed, some of which not. Um, at the network layer, exposed network ports. No, we actually feel pretty good that our VPCs and, and security group configuration is actually pretty good. Uh, uh, patching EC2 instances, you know, the host layer, not actually sure how we're taking care of that. That's another presentation for a different day. We've identified weak secrets management as an issue. And user submitted data, we think we're actually handling, again, this pretty well. So, Time to now you know, document our threat. What is our problem? We have weak password management within, within our environment. Um, at two points, our infrastructure, we're not managing passwords. We, uh, both points, there's highly valuable assets. And a breach would be pretty bad for us, OK? We have reputation loss, which leads to customer loss. We have uh, data that could actually be leveraged against one of our own customers. So now it's time to now it's time to rate this threat. Um, so risk, risk is probability times damage potential. That's the most simple way of actually thinking about what the risk of a threat is. Uh, again, be realistic on this. Uh, we think you know we think sophisticated attackers might be a after us, but again. It's probably current or former employees for most of us, automated attacks, some kid in Eastern Europe, et cetera. So to make uh, rating easier and a little bit less, uh, a little bit more precise and kind of like stop these subjective arguments, there are, um, there are rating frameworks. This particular one is called DREAD. Uh, and it makes it easier for us, again, to just agree on what, re what the real risks are in our, in our environment. So dread is damage potential, reproducibility, exploitability, affected users, and discoverability. And each one of these, we can rank them high, medium, and low, and we can generate a score based on that. And then we can, you know, we can stack rank you know, these scores against each other and figure out what needs to be taken care of first. Um, so here's how I rated our, our secrets management risk. Um, damage potential, yeah, this is pretty damaging. This is, this is definitely a, a high issue. Somebody gets access to this, um, again, it's something that they can use, ag they can use against. Um, we lose customers, they can use it against our customers. Reproducibility, uh, if you have, your, you, know, you have our usernames and passwords, you're gonna be kind of coming and going as you please. So you know, you're here today, you're here again tomorrow, you're here again next week. Exploitability, uh, it's somewhat easy to exploit. You know, if you can get access to the code, you can figure out what to do, but it requires some sort of existing access. Um, you've, probably, you've probably already in the network somewhere, and you're just doing a lateral movement now. Uh, so I kind of rank that medium, figuring that it's not an outside attacker, uh, it requires some sort of existing access, so it's not immediately uh, easy to exploit. Affected users, 
Again, this is our, you know, our database of all our events. It's all our users. This affects all our users. Hi. And discoverability, again, it's a few hops away from an outside user, it's, so it's not exactly easy to find. So for that reason, I decided to uh, rank that as a medium. And so finally, okay, we're gonna put this into action and actually, and actually clear up you know, this issue we have with secrets management. So constraints, okay? Um, we're going to you know, impose some constraints on the solutions that, we, uh, that, we're gonna, you know, that we're going to deliver. In particular, time. How long is it going to take us to actually implement the solution? Complexity. How hard is it to actually do this? How well do we understand what we're implementing? Operational risk. What happens when it fails? And these are all normal constraints that we should be, do you know, we should be weighing with every single technical decision that we make. Um, so a few of these slides are just from, uh, from, some of the, um, from some discussions I had around the original blog post. And these are the discussions that actually made me realize the importance of covering what, you, what to do when you can't be perfect and ultimately um, create this presentation. So time, something we all, you know, we, you know, uh, we all wish we had more of. Realistically, most of our work has to be time boxed. We don't have forever to work on a solution. And so... Um, you know, in that conversation, uh, somebody was asked, you know, why don't you take your time to just implement the best solution, you know? Why create some sort of technical debt? And the person was just straight up honest. I have nine other priorities, okay? This is literally not the most important thing for me to do right now. I simply just want to take a small step to making things suck less. Um, that, again, recognizing that we have multiple priorities is just something that we, have, that we have to recognize when every decision we make. Complexity, the devil is in the details. The person said, why? why not use Vault? It looks simple. I mean, I just deploy it. And it's like, okay, well, how are you going to handle the master encryption shards? Where are they stored? Who has access to them? What are your storage at backends going to be? How will you do authentication? Like, these are questions you actually need to answer. You can't just sit there and say, I deploy this. Awesome. And then uh, risk of failure. This was my favorite. Um, it's all code. We monitor it using Nagios. Okay? Um, you know, boom, done, nailed it. Okay? And I'll just let, and again, I will just let that, you know, that comment speak for itself. I won't say I haven't done that before, but it's not something you should probably be doing if you can avoid that. So the constraints we've established here, starting, time. I want to get something done in a, f you know, a few days to a few weeks, OK? The faster we, you know, faster we can get this done, the more likely we'll actually finish the work. Complexity. Uh, we're going to go with what we know. We're going to take less surprises. We have less to learn, less to get wrong. Risk. We're going to take only as much risk as we're, re as we're ready for. We're moving fast. Uh, personally, I want to limit the, uh, the, the, the failure blast radius when, you know, when something goes wrong. And so, finally, secrets management. Some approaches to actually getting you started when you're not ready for Vault. So, Git Crypt. Really super simple, okay? Encrypt secrets directly into your, in your repository. Go through your code, audit it, find your secrets, rotate them, and store them. You know, um, pro, you've actually audited your code. You're like a step ahead of many people actually having, you know, done that. Cons, you have symmetric encryption. You have to worry about the master key, you know, master key proliferation, et cetera. Um, your to-do is pretty much to prevent key proliferation and throw this out. <laughs> You know, but again, you know, it's, it's a build, satisfy your immediate needs, and throw it away later. You were at the worst point possible. You've at least started now improving. Configuration management systems. Let's start with Puppet. You have higher EAML. It encrypts values directly into your higher hierarchy. You can use public key encryption. You have multiple back ends. I personally used it. I loved it. Pros, centralized. Everything is now living at, you know, you have now at least con like coalesced everything into one repo. You have pu you know, public key encryption support that is useful. 
Uh, cons uh, my rec may require manual intervention when rolling puppet masters. I ran into that issue. Uh, you may need to clean up your puppet code if you haven't already moved to Hira. And now you're thinking, what? Puppet 5's already out, and they've been telling us to use Hira for years. There's probably several people in here still using Puppet 2.7, okay? There is a puppet installation from about six years ago that you still know is in existence and in use. Um, your to-do, uh, was, it was a, uh, the, one of the issues I had written down the last time I had done this was figuring out a master, like master rekeying strategy in case we had, to, you know, we had to roll everything quickly. Ansible, um, you know, Ansible Vault encrypts entire var files in your playbook. Uh, this is just, this actually ends up being a little bit just like Git crypt. Uh, you've done the exercise of at least auditing your code, okay? Um, you still have to deal with symmetric encryption. You, everyone needs, you know, the shared password. You have key proliferation issues. And your to-do is really, you know, preventing your, uh, the pro proliferation of the vault key. And, re you know, what do you do about rekeying and rolling secrets? S3 buckets. I found this when I was, when I, when I, again, when I was researching this. Sneaker. Encrypt, store, and retrieve se um, secrets from S3. Awesome. Secrets no longer are living in our repos, at least, okay? We've gotten them out of GitHub. We've, uh, we've reduced, the, you, know, the, you know, our secret proliferation. Um, cons? How are you managing your S3 buckets, okay? Um, anybody here, you know, before you really adopted CloudFormation and Terraform, was S3 just kind of the wild west of just people creating buckets and so forth? Yep, you're nodding your head. <laughs> yep, it's true. Um, so you're probably going to have to adopt some sort of management strategy for your, S, for your S3 buckets. You need to make sure who actually, ha you know, what, uh, who actually has access to these buckets and only, you know, should those, um, those entities have access to those buckets. So again, this might be something where it sounds great, but you actually have to handle now configuration management of your AWS resources before you can even do it. And so, okay, what should we have gotten out of all this? Me up here ranting and waving my arms and stuff? What should we have gotten? What? <laughs> logos, yes, logos and zero days. Just forget everything. Um, so. Less focusing on shiny objects, like that's a really sweet car and I'm sure it's fast, but it's also on fire, okay? <laughs> and more of this, we can manage this. Let us, let's systematically put out the garbage fires in our environment. Um, so, all right, nothing I have talked about here is particularly earth shattering, none of that technology. Uh, what is important, again, develop a plan, take incremental forward progress, and finally, thank you. And if you like this, I have a feedback form, straycat slash feedback, S-T-R-A-T-C dot A-T <laughs> slash feedback. Let me know what you thought of the presentation, what you thought of me. Give me suggestions. Awesome. Thank you.